You're listening to the A3K Network on Anime3000.com. Right now, I am with Stu Levy, who is the founder of Tokyo Pop, and um, from what I from what I gather, this is your first time on a on a podcast. It is, and thanks, Sean. Yeah, you're you're the one who is uh, de-virginizing me. So I was gonna go woohoo, but I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to respond to that. So I'll just I'll just move on. <laughs> um, First question I have for you. Can you point to a moment in your childhood where you realized you wanted to become a storyteller? That's a tough question. Um, you know, I think more or less my entire childhood was living in, you know, imagination land, basically just, you know, coming up with things. I think most children, frankly, storytellers are children who never grow up. So growing up with friends in the neighborhood. And, you know, at the time I'm a little bit older than most of you guys. So, um, we didn't have, um, a lot of the technology that, that everyone has now. And so we had to sort of play with our, um, action figures and, uh, put, you know, words in their mouth and make them do things and make them fight and make them, you know, run through the sand and, you know, do that sort of stuff. So we, we, in essence played with dolls And um, we did have video games at a certain stage, but they were really, really rudimentary, you know. So so we played video games that you probably, you know, have seen in all the retro collections. But, you know, from anything from Pong to, like, Asteroids to, uh, um, you know, Pac-Man and things like Defender, you know, those were were the games that we played, Donkey Kong. Um, But, you know, to us, um, playing, basically, was life. And so we just, you know, I, I just personally never really grew up. I, I still haven't grown up and I, I love to, you know, come up with stories and ideas and, and characters and, and just imagine situations. And some of them are based on true experiences and some of them are um, entirely fictional. Now, did you ever see, and this is a little quick follow up to this, did you ever notice a difference in the way that specifically talking about when if you're when you're playing with toys how you played with toys compared to how your friends play with toys did that ever come up or i only I only ask that because i yeah. i know when i was younger and i play i played a lot of toys by myself and i'd set them up in these elaborate worlds and and create scenes and things and then i go play with my friends and they're just banging my hand did you ever come across that I think, I think, well, the best thing is to ask, of course, my, my mom, what, you know, cause she remembers everything, but you know, I, I think with me, probably what was different about me than the other kids is I'd come up with like the, all of the situations. So everybody would gather and mm-hmm. bring their various toys and we'd all, you know, kind of meet in the, we had lived on a cul-de-sac, so we didn't really have much cars. And so we'd either be literally in the middle of the street or, you know, in somebody's yard. And then I'd always be the one coming up with the whole scenario. So it'd be like, you know, oh, today, um, <laughs> you know, GI Joe has just, you know, kind of come back from Vietnam War, and now we've got, you know, and I'd come up with, you know, whatever the story for the day was, and and we take it from there. So I, I think that was probably the difference between me and the other kids. Is I um, I did the hard work, and then uh, they they were the actors. I was behind the camera in essence. All right, before you, before you even had a camera in your hand, you were directing. Nice. Um, so you attended multiple universities and worked in various industries outside of anime and manga. Can you briefly explain explain how these experiences guided you to becoming the person you are today? Um, sure. Yeah, I I went to, you know, kind of a, a linear path, but went to. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, and because of that, I was exposed from very early to the entertainment industry. Um, you know, friends of mine. Their parents were in the business. And so, for instance, you know, being in high school and going to the Grammy Awards, you know, that was the kind of thing that that I did growing up that if I lived in any other town, I wouldn't have had that experience. So I was able to kind of hang out with and meet celebrities at a young age. And that taught me that basically celebrities are people, too. And, you know, everybody's kind of the same. And um, and that influenced me in the sense that I I really the I guess the the luster 
um, wore off when I was really, really young, and and I never really had this sort of admiration um, for celebrities per se, and that I think helps you when you're working in in any type of entertainment business to basically think of everyone as you know your friends on the playground and and what are you doing next um after high school i stayed in los angeles and studied economics um and business at ucla then i went to law school in on the east coast at georgetown and um then i studied in japan at keio university and tokyo university so basically all those things business law um japanese that all influenced my ability to frankly, pay the bills later um, and and understand sort of the business side of things as opposed to only the creative side. And you mentioned Japan. How did that time influence your decision to enter the world of media publishing? Well, when I went to Japan, um, I was fascinated with, I've always been fascinated with other cultures, um, Japanese culture being one of them. But for me, it, it was beyond Japanese culture. It's, it's all types of cultures that I still to this day um, love. I love learning about new cultures and, and experiencing them around the world. Um, but Japan was the first one that I was exposed to at a, at a very, um, you know, more than just a superficial level. So going there, living there, meeting the people, really taking oneself out of being a gaijin and really trying to dive into the local culture and 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 put your take yourself out of your element and learn what it's like um, to to live the way that Japanese people do, local people do. That that was something that I experienced um, early on, and it's through that that I learned about kind of entertainment there and what stories, what storytelling they like. Um, and I lived in a home in a, at a at a host family when I was first studying there, and that host family. There was a junior high school student, a um, couple kids, one of them in junior high. And every day, every evening, uh, we would eat dinner, and the mother cooked amazing dinners. And we would eat incredible Japanese food with the TV on. And it was either Dragon Ball or Sazai-san or Chibi Maruko-chan or some sort of anime every single day. And we would talk a bit. Well, also variety shows, I'd have to say. There was also some com- like comedy or what I you know, stuff like that. But people would talk, but they'd also really focus on the TV. So the TV was, which was very different than my upbringing. When I was growing up, my parents wouldn't allow television during dinner. So, you know, we had no choice but to talk amongst ourselves in in my family. So being in Japan and having the TV on, it became kind of a central um, theme. And because I was learning about Japanese culture and Japanese television, um, you know, that that was a big influence on me. So I learned about anime that way. Mm -hmm. And then how did that transition into you actually, um, you know, starting a public publication? So, okay. So yeah, good question. Um, so fast forward a couple of years and I was involved in, um, what we called new media at the time. And this was before the internet, we had CD ROMs. We would stick CDs in the computer, sort of like, you know, the last generation of DVDs, but this was the very, very first generation. And, through those CDs, we would run applications and we would watch, you know, tiny little postage size uh, video. It was really, really early. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was in that business and I had met some guys from Kodansha. We were actually at a, um, a trade show in the south of France, which was quite nice. And we hung out and, and we talked. And I told them my favorite, you know, at the time, my favorite manga was called Seiju, which ultimately became Parasite. And I told them, oh, my God, Kiseiju is so amazing. It would be a great movie. And we got to be friends. And they taught me a lot about, they taught me everything, basically, about manga publishing. One guy in particular, um, he really taught me um, not just what manga means, but how to make it and how Japanese publishers look at manga. And together, we decided to uh, build out a business in, in America to try to make, you know, create a manga market. And so that was, um, that was really the catalyst. And you brought a lot, a lot of the decisions that you made with Tokyo Pop, did that come from you being immersed in that culture? You know, obviously, you know, flipping, not, not flipping the books and um, the terms that you use, did that come from just being exposed to that culture the way you were? Yeah, I mean, certainly for me, I was very much 
um, and I still am, you know, Japan's my second home. And so the language, the culture, it, it really is something that I've always had an affinity for. Um, I grew up in, in L.A. living across the street from a Korean family, and so I spent a lot of time exposed to Korean culture. And while it's not the same as Japanese culture, in fact, Korean culture and Japanese culture have quite a lot of differences, there's also, of course, similarities. And so I felt really comfortable in Japan and, and learned the culture pretty quickly. Um, I, there's still you know, a lot I don't know, and I don't think anyone can ever learn everything about Japanese culture. Um, but that, that influenced the way that you know, I always thought of it as and at the time, it's hard for you guys to understand it now because manga is everywhere in America and around the world and anime is everywhere. But back then, it wasn't. It was very, very hard. Nobody really knew what it was. And so I always thought of it as, as an American, how can I experience this amazing form of entertainment, this, this amazing aesthetic, this storytelling? And so as a producer, as a you know, translator or publisher or whatever label, um, you know, whatever hat I was wearing at the time, I try to think about it from ultimately the person who's going to be on the receiving end. You know, how will they be most interested in discovering more? What will get them to kind of pay attention to it? And it was, it's always been hard because you don't want to assume that somebody knows anything about the Jap Japan, but at the same time, you know, if you are too simple minded about the whole thing and you quote unquote dumb it down, you know, too much, then it's also it's a little bit of the magic and the intrigue is gone. And so there's a balance and it's, it's very hard to find that balance. Do you feel that t taking risks was, you know, part of your, part of what made Tokyo Pop successful? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I guess like risk, it's a, it's really interesting talking about risk because in some ways I consider myself a very risk averse person. Like, you know, I'm at the stage in my life when all my friends around me have big mortgages and they're paying for their homes and paying off debt and I don't have a mortgage. Um, and, you know, I, debt scares me. You know, things like that, I'm very risk averse, I'm very conservative. But at the same time in my life, I, I go to all these places around the world. I'm, I, when I, I'm, I also, the past few years, have, I've dived into, you know, endurance athletics and I love it. And, and that's really risky. There's stuff that I take on as a, as an athlete that, that uh, frankly, you can die from. And, and so risk is this odd concept with me, but I get really excited by new challenges. That's really what motivates me. And so the risk aspect of those challenges, that's something that I don't focus too much on. I feel like if there's an inspiration that I'm feeling and there's something in that challenge that's exciting me, risk is not an issue. If it's just sort of the day to day and, and, you know, you're taking care of stuff that you have to do and there's nothing exciting about it, then I get very nervous about risk and I try to mitigate or I try to really, you know, decrease my risk. So I, I, I think of risk less in terms of risk itself, but more in terms of what am I trying to gain? What, what am I enjoying? What am I, what's this experience? What's in, the, in it for me with this experience from a, from a satisfaction point of view, what's going to ultimately you know, get, reach my heart, basically. And that kind of segues into my next question in reference to Tokyo Pop and, you know, some of the things that have happened to Tokyo Pop over the years. And in 2008, with the Great Recession and borders closing, Kodansha, just, you know, pulling titles from Tokyo Pop, um, you experienced some setbacks with the company. Now, sure. and, um, but there's also been a lot of criticism about Tokyo Pop and some of the decisions that were made around that time. And a lot of the blame of what happened to Tokyo Pop has been cited on, you know, oversaturation of new titles in the market around that time. And, and you know, a focus being paid on other media ventures within Tokyo Pop, you know, splitting the company. It, all those different things. Like, how do you respond to some of those criticisms um, when it, whenever it's brought up what happened to Tokyo Pop? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that we've struggled the entire time. You know, Tokyo Pop, it's pretty easy to focus on that period, um, which, you know, clearly did the most damage to Tokyo Pop than any other period. And, and it's easy to focus on that and say that was the, the one period of, very difficult times and the rest was all 
you know, really smooth, but really we struggled the whole time. There, it, there was never a moment at Tokyo Pop when I felt, oh, we got this down. There's really nothing to worry about. Things are great. I've never, ever felt that. It was always, I was always nervous about money. I was always wondering how are we going to pay the bills. You know, it was a constant, constant um, pressure. And at the same time, having investors that wanted us to go public and bring, of course, you know, you invest in something, you expect a big return. And our investors were, were really aggressive in that sense. They wanted a big, big return. And that puts a lot of pressure on the management team to deliver performance that's frankly sometimes above and beyond what's sustainable for a company. So that's a real businessy conversation. And I don't know whether your listeners are interested in that, but you know, there, there are, cause you know, there's the questions of fandom and then there's the questions of business and they're both really interesting. Um, and there's plenty of mistakes on both sides. Um, you don't, you, as an entrepreneur, as a producer, as an artist, you don't start anything at all, any endeavor, and expect um, people to just automatically embrace it and have all of your decisions be perfect and everyone to accept it. That's impossible. So, you know, the fact that there's criticism over the years, um, you know, that that's that's welcome. That's not um, something I've ever shied away from, and it certainly isn't something that discourages me from chasing my dreams and, and doing what I think. Um, is what you know what's what encourages me in life so you know criticism itself is if anything a fuel I'm fine with that and every single question every single issue is something that we can definitely discuss because I have a perspective on all of them and I'm the first guy that's going to say um, I'm there's many times I, I I'm not right there's many times I make mistakes and I feel like it's only by making those mistakes and it's only by trying things um, that I believe are, is the right thing to do at the time and then later understanding it wasn't. That's the only way I'm ever going to learn and grow. So so I'm cool with that. I, I have no and, – and people who know me know that. You know that, that in itself, I have no regrets about making mistakes. Um, but I can certainly explain them if people are curious. Like why did you do this? Why did you do that? Could you, should you have done something different? Some of the times – there was actually not anything else I feel like I could have done differently, but there are other times when certainly there was. Um, so, Sean, if you know if that's that's sort, I'm more than happy to break it down a bit and talk about specifics if if you think there are areas that are particularly um, interesting to your listeners. Yeah, I mean, I have just on that note, I do have one more thing to ask you, but outside of that, I really want to know more about you know you and and some of your motivations. So, this next question it kind of goes along that line with the, um, both the Rising Stars of Manga program and the original manga program that you had with Tokyo Pop. Could you explain a little bit more about what motivated you to start that? You know, you, you kind of brushed on, you know, risk and, you know, taking risks and things of that nature. This had to have been risky at the time. So why did you decide to go in that direction? Okay. Um, yeah, good, very good question. Um, and so first of all, I guess it's, a lot business, I guess there's a few ways to be an entrepreneur and to, and to run a business. I'm not a hired CEO. I'm not, I'm not somebody, you know, it's not like there's Yahoo and, um, you know, Yahoo is, is struggling. It's a public company and the stock's not doing well and they're looking for a new CEO and they call up me and they say, Hey Stu, will you, you know, run y Yahoo? You know, I'm not, I'm not, that's not me. You know, they're, they're never going to make that call and I would never accept that job because I, I would be very bad at it. Um, my, where I, I think I shine is where there's basically nothing in existence and coming up with a new idea and getting it to a certain point, you know, actually executing it, making it happen, turning something out of nothing. Um, and then handing it off is really probably best for me to do. And it's, it's hard though as an entrepreneur to know sort of when to hand something off and how to do it. Now, that's a, just a generic um, setup. But in terms of initiatives within the company, um, not every single initiative was mine, but, um, but quite a lot were. And um, Rising Stars was one of them. And um, oh, what we called OGM, but what, what now is called OEL, um, that was another. And, and the motivation behind that was what I saw in Korea um, and Taiwan, where manga markets from... Um, were built 
from Japanese manga being licensed and translated. But then after a certain point in the growth of the market, um, artists wanted to express themselves and their own stories, and they wanted to do it in that medium, the medium of manga, whether you think manga is a different medium than comic books overall, or you don't. Um, certainly, there was a large influence of Japanese manga um, on these particular creators in Korea and in Taiwan. And I saw that, and I saw a lot of them flourishing, a lot of them struggling, and a lot of them flourishing. And I thought it was healthy for, um, for in essence, the culture overall to, for, for artists to find, have a new way to express themselves. And I also, at the same time, you know, it was pretty early with DeviantArt, and, and I, and I saw a lot of American um, artists, especially young people, um, drawing, drawing manga style, in essence, and drawing um, their own stories. And I, and I know in Japan, they had what they call Shinjin Show. And Shinjin Show are competitions to encourage brand new manga artists and manga creators um, to submit their works and then give a prize for the winner and this kind of thing. So I felt, hey, this is really a natural step in our own market, um, a natural um, um, initiative to do as Tokyo Pop, where we stand for not just status quo, we're not just translated um, works, but encouraging artists and encouraging manga culture overall. So I think it's absolutely critical to do various activities and initiatives to encourage um, local artists. And I believe mu very much in that. I'll spend the rest of my career doing things that hopefully can encourage um, um, artists expressing themselves um, locally. And so, so couched in that background uh, came the idea of doing our own competition um, worldwide. And so we launched Rising, Rising, um, Rising Stars of Manga, which was, I think we did, I don't know exactly how many times we ran it, but I think it was at least eight. And it was very successful. We had thousands of, of applicants, and we gave prize money away um, every year and published um, the compilations. And we discovered some amazing talent. There was even incredible talent that didn't end up getting chosen. So um, I, I frankly didn't know that if, if there was criticism about Rising Stars among I do know there's criticism about some of the OL, OEL books we did. But Rising Stars itself, I've never heard anyone criticize that program. I, I think people really loved it. That's my impression. And I get tons of emails even now where people want more, want it again. They're like, please, please, can you bring back Rising Stars? And I'm thinking about it. Um, so that's sort of part one of the answer. And then part two is the OEL. Do you want to ask me anything, any follow up on that one? Or should I just go on? Yeah, I mean, one of the main things, I don't know if it applied to the Rising Stars or the OEL, but I know the main thing that kept coming up were you know, the, some of the contracts that were offered or yeah. some of your relationships yeah. with some of the artists. Um, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, uh, I can talk about that. Um, that's, and I've spoken about that before, but that's, yeah, that's sort of the OEL side. So that, that has nothing to do with the rising stars. Okay. Rising purely competition. Um, and we didn't have contracts with, you know, the winners. The winners could do whatever they want with their works. I mean, that was, it was not a, not conditional on Tokyo Pop investing in their properties. So, but what we did is, of course, if something won and we loved it, we started to talk to the artists. And um, based on that, my goal was to have a number of titles that Tokyo Pop, um, were Tokyo Pop in essence originals, where they're not licensed from Japan, but titles that we as Tokyo Pop financed, we marketed, we co-created in essence, which sometimes we did and sometimes it was more that we were mainly the publisher, um, but in essence creating an editorial program. And that's what we did. And it cost us literally millions of dollars, um, which you can certainly look at the company and say, well, was that a wise investment? Was it not? And that's its own sort of longer discussion. Mm -hmm. But to this day, I'm, I'm very pleased that we did the program. I think we did a little, we definitely did too much too fast. And that, you know, you had mentioned putting, saturating the market with books. We in general, as a company, did too much too fast. Um, that that I, I really do believe is the case, including putting out too many titles too quickly when we built up the OEL program, um, rushing to put out a lot of product. And most of that was the pressure that I felt from my investors, as I mentioned, which is grow, 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 build up the revenue streams. And, um, and so I tried to get a lot of product out there in the hopes that more would be larger hits. 
Um, whereas looking back, I think it would have been better to limit the amount of product and to really focus on the product, um, the, each each particular title um, reaching its maximum potential. And I think it was harder to do that with when you have too many titles. You certainly we tried. We we put we put together compilation sampling. We had very large booths at trade shows. We had we offered every author an opportunity to show up and 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 talk about their stuff. We interviewed many many authors, put them on uh, YouTube. So we tried to promote each and every single book and do it as best as we could. But inevitably, I think when you have a lot of product in the marketplace, it's hard. And especially with OEL, the fandom wasn't quite ready for it. I think they are now, and they have a lot more respect for it now. But at the time, they only really wanted stuff from Japan. So it, and we, we did anticipate that to be the case, but we had more resistance on OEL than we had ever thought we would. And so it made it hard because we, even with all of the marketing activities we did, the market wasn't the, – the demand for the titles didn't exist. And so that made it hard. And within that environment, a few really took off and became hits, but most did not. And I believe in those titles. I think they're great titles. And so I think it's disappointing. Um, you know, Looking back, some of them probably would have been better in a different format. Maybe some would have been, be, would have been better in color. Um, you know, we at Tokyo Pop, when we put books in bookstores, the bookstores always put our books in the manga section, no matter what we tried to do. Um, and so it was easier for us to not fight that because the times that we tried, we never won. So we called everything manga, whether really that was best or not. Um, we just had the resistance at the bookstore level to do anything else. We even joked around a lot in the company that if Tokyo Pop had put together like a pure cookbook, Mm-hmm. Not a manga cookbook, but just literally recipes for, like, say, I don't know, uh, um, Italian cuisine. You know, we happen to publish an Italian cookbook. They would put it in the manga section. <laughs> okay. Right? So so basically, that was a wall that we had to hit. And the book, you know, the bookstores are the gatekeepers. They're your partners, but they also have their own opinions. And so because of all of that, I think there were, you know, there were titles that didn't reach an audience that possibly they could have. There were a lot of titles that, frankly, would have never reached an audience, um, no matter what was done. And so, if you're an author um, and you believe that your title should have done better, and you know it didn't hit, you know, there, you'll be frustrated automatically. You know, you're going to be frustrated. You're you're frustrated if your title doesn't hit, no matter what. You know, I'm also an author, and I've had hits, and I've had you know losers. And when you're when you create something that doesn't hit, it's very frustrating. So there are certain authors that I believe really vented that frustration at Tokyo Pop and at me. Um, we never, ever, ever violated a contract ever. We always paid what we were committed to paying contractually, um, and did a lot beyond that. We've never violated a contract, so I want that to be clear. Tokyo Pop has never done anything um, that was illegal, ever. Um, and we believe that we ethically supported our authors but above and beyond what a lot of other publishers would have done. Okay, and do you see a future for um, a, a original global manga ever in the market or anything from Tokyo Pop with the properties that you currently have? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we're, you know, these are properties that we co-invested in. We think of it like this. You're an author. You have an idea. We, as a Tokyo, as Tokyo Pop, we have an editorial team. Our editors meet you and you guys talk. Um, Sometimes that means together really coming up with the details of the story. Sometimes it means um, that being entirely on your side and then you pitching it. Um, a combination of, of um, possible scenarios and then Tokyo Pop decides let's invest in this and then we pay you and you make that manga and then we distribute it, we publish it, we market it um, and we together we own it. That's the structure that we did. We had a um, and we're very clear about that you know and, and there, there are different ways you can do business. One way is we can pay you and you don't own anything that's work for hire. Another way is um, we cannot pay you at all, and you can pay us to publish it, 
and then you own your copyright. There's a couple co companies out there that do that method, um, famous comic book publishing companies. Um, so there's different types of models. Our model was we'll, we'll split it with you. We'll pay you some money because we know you need money to live and it'll be decent money. And then, but it won't be, for instance, as high as if we paid you for work for hire, meaning if we owned it outright. Um, but in exchange, we'll share the copyright and we'll own it together. We'll be partners. And we explained, of course, those contracts to every author that signed them and the contracts understood that and signed the contracts and said, let's do this. There's nobody that ever forced anybody to sign any contracts, of course. Um, so they decided to be partners with us. If, you know, if it was your work, we would be partners together. And because of that, we have some incredible um, re partnerships now and, and titles that are doing really well and titles that I'm producing, either as film or television shows. Um, we've got a number that have been rolling out as eBooks um, on Comixology and other platforms. Um, there'll be, you know, there's a future for a number of those titles, assuming that there's a marketplace that wants them. And yeah, I anticipate that Tokyo Pop will do some new ones in the future too. All right. And um, since you've kind of already started touching on it, we're going to move on to the current state of Tokyo Pop. And okay. what, it, what's, what is Tokyo Pop doing right now? Right now, Tokyo Pop. Well, okay. So there's Tokyo Pop in the States. There's Tokyo Pop in Europe. We have a, a couple different um, branches. Um, so in Europe, Tokyo Pop is mean is really focused on the German market. We have a company in Germany uh, with the staff, and we still publish printed publications. Um, we put out a number of books each month. Um, many, most are licensed from Japan. There are a few that are um, originals, just like we've done here. OEL, they're they're not OEL. They're OGL since they first come out in German. Um, so. It's a similar structure to what we used to do in America. Um, that's what we do in Europe, and it's been the business has been doing great. Um, never the ups were never as high as the American market, but then the downs were never as low. You know, the German economy as a whole is a lot more stable. They they aren't you know America we we sort of we kind of go balls to the wall on things as a country as you know. Um, and our economy is that way too. And so that's actually the same in our little anime manga market segment. Um, and so the, the ups in Germany were not as high and the, the, the lows are not as low. And so, so we, do, we do a pretty good job out there. Um, out here in the States, um, we, 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 we shut down the publishing division um, and the, the staff back in 2011 when borders, when we lost uh, borders, um, and to be clear about that, uh, you know, in case somebody doesn't know, um, borders owed us quite a lot of money, close to a million dollars, and they didn't pay us a single dime. So we lost all that money, and at the same time, they were our number one customer, and we lost all that business literally overnight. Um, and we were already, frankly, kind of hurting from 2008. We were barely hanging in there. We had to reduce our staff significantly um, in 2008 when the first economy crash hit us hard. Um, and But we were hanging in there. We were doing it, and we were trying to build up what we could based on digital platforms in the future. Um, but then the borders thing hit, and it was just it was too much. We couldn't overcome that. And so I had to shut down the whole team, and we, um, and we stopped publishing. And now, then I spent about a year um, for charity for um, Tohoku, um, volunteering up in, up in Japan for the tsunami, um, and then came back and focused on basically little by little trying to build a new version of Tokyo Pop. So that's where we are today. Um, so publishing, this is a question that we get a lot. In my opinion, the publishing model that we used to have, which is you print your books. You don't know how many are going to sell. You print a bunch of books. You put them out in the shops, and you hope they sell. If they don't, they come back. Um, that model is a very, very challenged model in the U.S. market. We don't have very many um, successful bookstores. Borders is gone. Barnes & Noble loses a lot of money, and there's 
definitely questions on how long they will be around. Um, really, the strongest bookstore is Amazon. So having a physical presence in bookstores um, in in towns, um, that's, you know, there's local comic book shops. I think, if anything, a local comic book shop or a boutique bookstore has a better chance of surviving nowadays than a mm. big chain. And so hopefully there's ways to work with them in a way that, that makes sense economically. I know there are other publishing companies that are able to pull it off right now. Um, they didn't have quite the exposure in the marketplace that we did from books already out there. Um, they also, you know, a lot of American comic book companies focus on the, com- the comic, board, comic book distribution and those, those shops, which ironically when they were weak, they held down the sales but now that they're the only ones left, they're consistent. So in a way, they're kind of like the German market. They didn't have the highs and they didn't have the lows. They've been there consistently the whole time. I have in a tremendous amount of respect for comic book shop owners. Um, manga was always a bit different th- from American comics. And so I think manga building up in the bookstores, it, it didn't allow the presence to be built within comic book shops. But So the market's a little different. Um, but, you know, just looking at it, you know, a little bit from the side, I, I think those comic book shop owners are heroes. Whether they'll always be able to continue that business or not, I, I think it's a big question. Um, you know, as you know, things have changed a lot and they're, continue, they're, gonna, they're going to continue to be, um, to be drastic changes in our, in, in, we're using it with technology disrupting um, traditional entertainment. And it's, books are not immune at all. Um, so Tokyo Pop and, and where, how we will be able to get manga out to people and how will we be able to monetize that so we can stay in business and how will fans be able to consume that manga, that's all up in the air. That's stuff that I think everyone, including myself, we're, we're all trying to experiment that, uh, with that and figure it out. Um, but I'm determined to find a way to, to make that happen in the future. And, uh, and I'm, still, I'm still looking to to see what exactly is the business model, what exactly is the sweet spot. And um, I earlier, I believe last year, I saw some, you know, newsletters with you and the Nerdist. Like, what's your relationship with, with that um, particular company? Well, Nerdist, when Nerdist was handling the Asian pop culture um, newsletter for us um, for, I don't know, a year, a year and a half, but then they sold the Legendary and since that time, Legendary decided to really change that business and stop doing that Asian pop culture newsletter. So right now, we don't have a relationship with Nerdist other than they're our friends. Um, but for a while, that's what they were doing. They were handling the Asian pop culture newsletter, which we now do on our own. Okay. And as far as Write Stuff? Write Stuff, we, write stuff has a print-on-demand POD program. Mm-hmm. So... We have made our library available through Write Stuff. So, if you want to buy, for instance, a copy of Psycom or Riding Shotgun or Bizengast or DramaCon or you know some of these titles that are in essence OEL titles, wonderful titles, the the whole library is available through them on print on demand. So even if we don't have stock in something, you can buy it and you can you can have a printed version shipped to your house. So if I can just take everything you just said and is, and regurgitate it to you just so I understand. Tokyo Pop right now, you're kind of in a holding pattern to see how you can make publishing manga work. And your arm in Germany is running successfully, but it's pretty it's pretty stable. Not a lot of highs, not a lot of lows. And um, as far as the titles that you do own, you have you're not sitting on it. You are making some of them available through this on-demand service through Right Stuff. Yeah, I think that the nuances of that are a little different, but in general, that's right. Um, just to to clarify some of the nuances, all of the titles are available. Okay. So everything that we were able to make available, we have. So we haven't selected certain ones; they're all available. In fact, we together with Right Stuff published Business Guest Eight, which was not out. Um, and SciComm 3, which which was not out. So those were new titles that we published together with Right Stuff. I've read some comments about Business Guest 8, and some people misunderstand and think that, for instance, the author published that herself, or Right Stuff published that. That's not the case. We Tokyo Pop published the, that title, um, to working together with the author and Right Stuff. 
So, you know, we're still here. You know, we, we still are active and it may look like a holding pattern, but in, in fact, there's, you know, quite a lot of small activity that we're doing and research that we're doing. It just compared to the past where we were publishing 40 titles a month and we were at a big, you know, presence at, at you know, comic book conventions and we had a big staff, you know, that's not the situation for us. But it doesn't mean that we're, we're not here and we're not active. We're just not doing it in as, a, um, as obvious of a way as we used to. And... And I guess the final question I have for you, which is a sort of a broad question, what are some goals that you hope to accomplish before you retire, both professionally and um, personally? Well, that's a that's a good question. I have a long way to go. You know, I'm I may not be a a, a spring chicken anymore, as they say, but uh, but I stay young and healthy. I I you know, I, like I said, I'm an endurance athlete, so I uh, I'll go toe to toe with most people that are half my age and physically. Uh, um, beat them in a race. So, you know, in that sense, I've got a long way to go. And, um, and yeah, my, my dream is to, to find new ways to encourage, uh, au- um, artists and, and authors, um, and storytellers. And so I love film and television, as people know. Um, I, I obviously love manga. Um, and, um, I will, I hope to, contribute a lot to that world and one of the things that's a dream of mine is to to create you know a blockbuster hit to have a title that everybody remembers and everybody says oh that was awesome and it was a title that you know that was created by either myself or someone that I supported um, as opposed to finding a hit from Japan or a great title and, and translating that which is a wonderful thing to do as well but for me being m- even more involved in the, the original creation is something that I personally love. All right. And any, I know I said that was the last question, but any announcements, anything that coming down the pike with Tokyo pop, you should be looking out for any, any, well, you know, I mean, we have, we have, um, a few things that, that we're working on We're we're, you know, people may or may not be interested. Sometimes we've been trying, a um, for instance, riding shotgun, we, we, there was an animation that, that we had made um, together with um, a company called Copernicus, an anima- animation studio up in Canada, um, and Michael Davis, a writer-director. And we had put it up online on the Mondo channel, Mondo Media, and it got millions of views. People loved it. So we're doing an Indiegogo, a crowdfunding campaign, to raise money to create more of Riding Shotgun, which was based, of course, on... Um, one of our um, our mangas, one of our graphic novels, and that that is going on right now. There's ten more days, so if I can, you know, promote that, I'd love for people to come check it out and see if they're interested. Um, it's not for everyone. It's it's over the top, crazy, um, but tons of fun. Um, so if you search "Riding Shotgun" on Indiegogo, um, you can see that that program, and we link to it, of course, from our site. Um, and then another crowdfunding thing that we're not doing is Tokyo Pop, but we're, we've licensed and we're supporting is the Bizengas title um, has a video game that's in the works right now by a really creative um, video game developer named Cosmic Forces. And they're doing a Kickstarter, so another crowdfunding right now to create the game. Um, that's going on currently as well. So for both Bizengas and Riding Shotgun, um, there are specifically these crowdfunding campaigns. Um, there's a number of other activities um, that we're working on that are not related to crowdfunding, but hopefully we'll provide with a television show or a film or new manga in the future. And so what I, what I can say is, you know, sign up if you can with a newsletter or check out our Facebook and just stay tuned. And there's always something fun going on. And where can I go to get all that information? You have um, is everything yes. central on your website? Definitely, yeah. TokyoPop.com. We have blog a blog on there that you can go through and read, and we have a newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter if you don't already get it. And that's Stu Levy from Tokyo Pop. Thank you so much for your time answering all of my questions. Sure. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on, and I will let you go. All right, John. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.